I'm Lieutenant Greg Lemke with the Fargo Police Department and I am a patrol supervisor. I also serve as the GLBT liaison for the Fargo Police Department and currently this is the regional training center for the Fargo-Moorhead area and we have a police academy going on right now and um, I do part of the training for the sexual orientation diversity. And uh, what is the purpose of the training that you do? It's, it's to give people information um, that they don't normally get. The, a lot of the diversity training that goes on in law enforcement never touches on GLBT issues. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of ignorance out there. And so it's just to get people, give people information to know, let them know that there's resources in the area that they can go to, that I'm a resource and, and that they just need to reach out if they need help with something. Uh, what kind of reaction have you gotten from the trainings? It's been all positive. I actually, I can sit in the room like today and look at a couple people and, and kind of tell that they don't want to be here. I mean, I'm making an assumption here. But overall, it's been, it's been positive. I know that we get, uh, they have to fill out forms or, or sheets, surveys afterwards, and it's always been positive. Um, a few years ago, actually, when I was leaving, I had a, a guy follow me out and, and say he needed to talk to me. And he said, um, you know, when I was in high school, I used to pick on this one kid all the time that I thought was gay. I called him names, I teased him, I pushed him around. And he said, it's really bothered me ever since. And after you talked about that stuff today, he's like, what do I need to do? You know, I gave him advice and just said, if he's around, I'd look him up and go talk to him. Let him know how you really feel. I don't know if he, if he ever did, but I think it does have that type of an impact on some people. Um, what's it like for you to be an out police officer? It's not, not an issue uh, currently because of obviously um, I'm a supervisor and our department is, is really enlightened. I think our former chief uh, that's now in, in California, um, he set the, a bar that he's not going to tolerate any type of discrimination, any jokes, any talk, any hate talk, anything like that. So he's, he set the, the, uh, the bar pretty high. And then I think we've just got a lot of, of young people who are educated, more open. I think society's more open as a whole. So it's not an issue now. When I first came out um, 10 years ago, 15, I lose track of time, um, it was, it was a very difficult. It was very different. It was a, a difficult situation. I had supervisors that I had I heard making jokes prior about you know being gay and stuff like that, officers saying they wouldn't help me if I needed help. Uh, having one officer actually come, uh, I give him credit for being open, but he asked me to come and talk with him and said, um, I don't like gay people, I don't agree with gay people, it's going to be difficult for me to work with you, but I will be professional and I will help you out. So I, I give him credit for that, but, but it's, it's, uh, it was hard to hear that. And, and even as a f uh, few years back, uh, there was another supervisor who I was with, and uh, when I first got promoted and he said, I want you to know that, that um, I don't have an issue with your being gay, it's okay with me. And I just said, well, I appreciate that, but I'm not looking for your, your stamp of approval. You know, I understand what you're trying to say. So I think there's still that level of ignorance, but the environment is, is vastly improved around here. And, and for me, it's not that difficult. I know that we do have some uh, other officers within our department, some, some females who identify as lesbian, and their reaction they get is a little bit mixed, sad to say. Um, again, some of it probably comes into play because I'm, I'm one of the bosses, so there isn't really that much conflict. But it's probably still a little difficult, I think, for the officers out in the field with some of the officers. But overall, it's a better environment. Um, why did you decide to come out when you did? Well, it's an interesting story when I did because there was uh, the actually I believe it was uh, when President Clinton was in office, and I think the uh, Defense of Marriage Act was going around and being passed by by states or being discussed by states that it was being discussed in North Dakota, and in a local paper um, there was a, a a letter from a person who identified anonymous who identified themselves as gay, saying gay people need to stay in the closet that he worked for a church and he could accomplish more and help more people and help more kids if he stayed closeted. So he was encouraging gay people, stay in the closet, don't come out, you can accomplish more, you can be a, a, contribute more to society. And it made me very angry. 
And so without thinking, I just fired a response off and a letter, threw it in the mail, and as soon as I dropped it in, I thought, what did I just do? Oh, my God. And, of course, they printed the letter. Um, so that's what spurred me to, to come out publicly at work. Um, it was, I was very anxious. I had no idea how it would be received. I was in the schools at the time teaching as a DARE officer, and so I had a big fear there, too, because the connection people make with being gay and being a pedophile. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get in big trouble. I'm going to get kicked out of the schools. And it, that reaction wasn't there. It was, it was mainly positive from a lot of people that I worked with. Um, I even went and talked to the chief and, and wondered about the schools, and he said, it's about your work. It's not about that. If the schools say they want you out because you're gay, we're not going to go along with that. It's about your work product. And so it was, it was very difficult. Time, obviously, a lot of stress and anxiety, but it, it worked out fairly well. But it, it, it shouldn't have to be that way, and I hope in environments, this day and age, it's not as bad for others. The environment in North Dakota as a whole is not good. It's kind of what I would call backwards. Um, Fargo is, is good. Um, it's more progressive. It's the biggest city in the state. It's right next to Minnesota. So it is a lot more progressive. Um, but when you get west of here, it's a different story. I mean, there's no, they've tried for several years to get various uh, L LGBT legislation passed, and it's failed. Um, I know this, this last year they tried to get um, sexual orientation included and protected for housing, um, and that failed. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty backwards environment in, in the rest of North Dakota. But the eastern part, especially here in Fargo, is, is more progressive. Um, the local Pride Collective uh, that's for Fargo-Moorhead region is housed in Fargo. Fargo has a human, they call it a Human Relations Commission. I don't know why, you know, Moorhead has its Human Rights Commission. But so, so they, they try and deal with all types of issues and, and be progressive in, in the city of Fargo. I know that with, with benefits have, has been an issue for me. I've been requesting domestic partner benefits in Fargo for, you know, since I came out. And it just seems to get put on the back burner all the time. You know, we've gone through since I've been here four or five HR directors, and I'll do it. I'll look into it. And you know, at one point it, it was getting close, and one of the commissioners came out against it and said he'd do everything he could to fight it. So they backed off. And so that that's one frustrating thing is that we you know try to progress in that way. Even for our pensions, when I first came out, um, I wanted a change in our pension to say I could leave it to my partner, as opposed to it said you leave it to a spouse or child. And that was even a fight. I mean, it did happen after a time, but it was to even get those small incremental progressive steps in, in, in this area is a fight. So it's, it's an uphill battle, I guess, um, around here for, to getting things accomplished for the GLBT community. Mm -hmm. and, um, you talked about hate crimes during mm -hmm. your presentation. Can you, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, if there's hate crimes protections in, in North Dakota or like, what that looks like here? There are none. There are no hate crimes protections in, in North Dakota. City of Fargo um, doesn't have any local ordinances or, or anything either to deal with that. And we've had some in the past, uh, you know, some more minor ones. We've had uh, a couple of homicides uh, over the last 10 years or so that were directly related to uh, gay bashing, I guess you would call it. And, and still that hasn't and spurred on anybody to take on that. Uh, the cause to try and get hate crimes legislation passed. Again, in Minnesota, you go right across the river here, and, and you have all those protections in that legislation. So it is—it's kind of a different, different world once you cross that river. There's there's just no protections over here for jobs, uh, for employment, or anything like that. And, um, why do you feel personally that hate crimes legislation is important? I feel it's important because. It, when a hate crime is committed, it affects a whole community of people. Um, if somebody is out beating gay men because they're gay or because they're perceived to be gay, that affects all the GLBT people in that community thinking, am I next? And are they going to escalate? What's next? Today they beat me up. Tomorrow are they going to come and kill me or burn my house down?